and we're live. Welcome. Good evening or morning, depending on where you're joining us. And welcome to this month in IPFS. Uh, I'm your host, Daniel. I'm a developer advocate for IPFS. And this is a community-oriented live stream to cover all of the progress that is happening in the IPFS ecosystem. It's also, because it's a live stream, it's meant to be interactive. So we want to hear from you. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, we can see the comments coming in. Um, let us know where you're joining us from, what you're doing with IPFS. We're always curious to hear that. Um, and if you're watching this post-event, um, feel free to drop the questions in the uh, comments. Uh, we check those out and uh, we like to always hear from you. So let's get to today's guests because that's what really this uh, live stream is all about. Today we have really special guests. Um, and we have three of them. We have uh, Brendan O'Brien, who's uh, building and contributing to IPFS uh, for a number of years. And he's now at number zero working on IRO, a new implementation of IPFS in Rust. And today's going to join us to talk a little bit about the new direction of IRO and what's happening with IRO. Um, we have Robin Berjon, who's heading governance and standards at uh, Protocol Labs, and he's focused on IPFS too. And finally, we have uh, Ryan Plauche, who's working on the IPFS in Space project. This IPFS Space in project, we're going to get into this uh, a little bit later once Ryan joins. Uh, but we mentioned this in a previous uh, live stream. I believe it was the January or the February one. Um, so today we're going to get a chance to look at some of the technical nitty gritty details and uh, talk about some of the challenges that uh, Ryan is facing when working uh, on this project. So with that, I want to get into our first guest, guest of today, um, that is Brendan O'Brien, and I'll give Brendan uh, a short introduction. So Brendan, as I mentioned, he's been building and contributing to IPFS for a number of years, and now he's working at number zero um, on IRO. So with that, let's bring Brendan. Hey, Brendan. Good to have you here. Hi, Daniel. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Pretty well, pretty well. I'm really, I've been, uh, uh, yeah, so yesterday, let me start by saying yesterday I was watching the uh, video you up, put up on Blake3. Blake3 is this, mm. uh, um, some people may be familiar, it's a new cryptographic hash function. Um, and you're using it in a really interesting way. And we're going to get into the details of that. So anyways, I'm I was super excited to have you join. Uh, I've been following Iro eagerly from day one. And uh yeah, that's uh, so. I'm super excited. How about yourself? No, oh, good. Thank you, Daniel. It's nice to be here. You know, it's it's a YouTube game recognized YouTube game. It's nice to see you putting together these incredible, high quality productions for the IPFS community. And so, yeah, delighted to be here and happy to chat about IRO and everything we're doing at Number Zero. Great. So maybe you can give us uh, a, a bit of an introduction to what IRO is and what it aspires to be. Totally. Yeah. Um, Thank you for the tee up. Uh, we, a number of us started Number Zero specifically to build IRO. The whole company exists to make that project to begin with. And a lot of us sort of had this kind of um, unfinished business vibe with IPFS where we were like, we think we could take this into a really uh, new stratosphere in terms of performance. And in particular, we really wanted to build an implementation of IPFS that performed along Web2 standards. So taking going from on the order of tens of requests a second up into the thousands and ideally the hundreds of thousands of requests a second for cached information but really just taking a very fine-tuned performance oriented version uh sort of cut on an ipfs implementation and we started that uh and, and initially we also at the same time wanted to be the most compliant possible and so for the first six months of working on iro we made it a completely stock compatible with kubo compliant implementation and as time went on, we sort of like learned a lot in that process and really came to understand where we did and didn't think that our goal of building a highly high performance IPFS stack and a highly interoperable IPFS stack may have come into tension. And so for that, we decided, you know what, we're members of the IPFS community and the IPFS standards and specifications are delivered kind of a la carte. And so what if we evolved IRO into something that is sort of maybe an IPFS system at the highest order, but is a kind of reimagination of the stack from certain other perspectives. So we made a number of changes to try and uh, take IRO closer to this sort of performance. And uh, we're delighted to say after a couple of months, we have, we've had one new release under this new paradigm. We're doing the second release this week uh, of the new IRO. And we're now seeing uh, performance numbers that we're really excited about. We're seeing, uh, we've built 
uh, something called an experimental loop so that we can actually see on a per commit basis how our technology is performing in network simulations. And we're just really excited to deliver sort of a new cut of IPFS um, and expand sort of the big tent of implementations that are out there. And it's hard to not mention the Move the Bytes working group, which you started, I believe, at IPFS, or it was Dig, your uh, uh, colleague. You started this at IPFS camp in uh, Lisbon. It was part of a talk about actually how BitSwap works. Um, mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, Move the Bytes working group? What was some of uh, the insights that came out of that and how that influenced your work um, on IRO? Totally. Yeah. So when you think about what IPFS does at its core, it's really, it's got three major tricks, content addressing, right? So it's going to take all of your data and always refer to it by hash. It's going to do something called content routing. It's going to figure out who has which hashes and what data. And then it's going to do data transfer, right? Get me the stuff from the people who have it. And so Move the Bytes Working Group is really focused on that third category, the data transfer side of things. And we really wanted to, uh, w a lot of that grew out of writing an implementation of BitSwap. And we needed one in Rust because there wasn't one in Rust that we knew of that was interoperable. There had been BitSwap implementations that followed the spec, but didn't sort of in practice communicate meaningfully with Kubo, which kind of was the whole jam. And so based on that, we found a number of things, uh, again, with this sort of like heavy lens around performance uh, that got us sort of like, ah, we're, we think we can do better here. And so at IPFS Camp in 2022, we uh, convened a group, as you mentioned, Dick, my co-founder, uh, came hot off of writing that implementation, said, hey, what if we took a cut at uh, writing a new data transfer protocol? Let's try something new. And we just realized that, like, again, as a community effort, it would it's better if you do it together. And so we try to sort of bring more folks into that. And so we formed the Move the Bytes Working Group as a sort of exploratory, hey, who wants to put their hand up and work on this uh, side of things? And what was really fun about the way that that evolved is over time, we just started meeting every two weeks. And uh, a lot of really exciting ideas started coming out of the woodwork. We, just being totally blunt, we never really uh, ended up accomplishing the goal of actually replacing BitSwap whole, wholeheartedly. But we did come up with I think we ended up in a really nice place when you rethink about it as a research group and, for, and a presentation of what good research exists in terms of moving bytes around. And so we're, we're pretty proud of the way that that group has evolved in terms of disseminating research. And that's really what its focus has evolved to be about. Um, inside of IRO, we have a new data transfer protocol and we present our work um, pretty routinely to the group, as well as others. We've heard from a number of sort of data transfer oriented projects and ideas that I think the now now we're at the phase as a community is like we just need to start coalescing around these and ideally moving forward around the right right ones. And this brings us to this new direction of IRO. What are some of the it's it looks to me also from the approach that you've been taking is that it's not only or a purely a, a research oriented one. Really you're trying to bring this into like real world applications. What are some of the use cases that you think that IRA will excel at? Um, and what are some of the new opportunities that you think haven't been sort of seized with IPFS as a protocol? Yeah, I think it's, and I think the sort of where, where IRA will excel is if you need web two perf for an IPFS like system, where it won't excel is if you need interoperability with existing IPFS systems, uh, we, those two things are, that's not where it's going to deliver for you. But uh, there are a number of groups uh, and there are a number of just brand new spaces that we haven't taken IPFS to that we're thinking about here. I, IRO is really a grow the IPFS pie project. It's not a um, sort of like change the existing IPFS user base project. And the thing that we're really targeting is mobile phones. And so we really want to see, we think there's a really great opportunity in developing in the native mobile space and in native mobile application developers being able to leverage peer-to-peer -peer technologies. Uh, we think this area is specifically exciting because you have a really nice set of APIs that give you access to uh, low-level networking protocols that you're often locked out of in the browser context. We still want to support browsers in the long run, but like that's not really our, our core focus. But if you need a thing that is IPFS-like and really, really fast and works inside of work like fast by Web2 standards fast, then IRO is going to be a great fit for you. If if you, it, it'll be an even better fit for you if you have total control over the stack. But um, if you need to interoperate with Kubo, 
we long term there will be an answer there, uh, and we've had some really exciting conversations. But as you mentioned at the top, our you know a lot of our work centers around the use of Blake three and different chunking schemes, and or a different chunking scheme, a different data transfer protocol. Um, Iro doesn't use libp2p under the hood as of right now, um, and so there's there's a lot of bridges to cross before we sort of achieve that level of interoperability. And you mentioned the chunking process and uh, Blake three. So in this new approach, you're making use of Blake three, which is really exciting. Um, you've, as I mentioned, you pre- pu- you published uh, Rudiger did a, a great deep dive into some of the details of of Blake three, and maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Of, I have sort of my own intuitions based on watching that video, but why do you mm. think that Blake three is such a natural fit for IPFS? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. It's been fun to watch the Blake three hashing algorithm sort of make its way into the content addressed zeitgeist. Can we call it a zeitgeist? I don't sure. Uh, the, <laughs> because it what Blake three does internally to to build a faster hashing algorithm is it actually builds a Merkle tree as part of its hashing construction, and so there's just this natural symmetry between chunking, as we understand it in IPFS and chunking as it happens inside of Blake three hashing. Uh, and as Rudiger goes into detail, he sort of explains this all in a deep dive. But basically, by just using Blake three, you get a lot of the same benefits that we have to do uh, as additional layers on top um, of a hashing algorithm in the current IPFS paradigm, right. And so with Blake three, we're able to push a lot of that just down into the hashing function, which has a certain degree of elegance to it. It uh, you sacrifice some flexibility, right? And so if you think about like a, in UnixFS right now, we have different chunking strategies. So you can use something like a Raven chunker, which will achieve in theoretically more internal deduplication if your data has a lot of self similarity. But uh, with Blake three, you get this incredible efficiency in that the chunking algorithm is basically decided for you. You can choose these multiples of uh, chunk group sizes, which is basically just a squashing the tree mechanism that Brudiger goes into much better detail about. But what it, the benefits that it gets you on the other side is by having this like just clean, hey, let's just use Blake 3 where we used to use uh, a really tunable chunking setup is the whole entire implementation of IRO gets really, really simple. If you can calculate the Blake 3 hash of anything, it will be the same output that we use for verified streaming for chunking strategies, it will just match. And so now we get this wonderful alignment where we have an IPFS system that can use whole file checksums. And so we see this you know, in the world, you see like, hey, here's a SHA-2, 256 checksum of a file. If we use Blake 3 in IRO, that value would be the exact same as the incrementally verified chunk thing that we use to actually do transfer, did transfer, hey, I'm gonna transfer half of a file and make sure that it actually came in correctly. Um, so we get a lot of those nice benefits. And it's a you bit of a rant, but... no, no, that was great. That was great. So you mentioned verified uh, streaming. Um, I guess is is the use case for this like if you say doing uh, video streaming and you want to do obviously verified because that's the sort of the key idea behind IPFS and you want to seek to so, sort of the middle point of the video, then you don't have to actually stream all of this extra data. You can just stream the data that is necessary for that and still be able to verify it without sort of a bigger added tax. Is, is that yeah, a good way to frame it? Sort of. Uh, so what you're referring to is being able to select or uh, transfer byte ranges inside of a total, which is a cool benefit that comes out of incremental verification. And so incremental verification means that you don't have to download the entire file to know that you got what you asked for, right? So if you imagine just a whole file checksum, I have to download every single byte of that file. Let's pretend that file is a video. So I need, I need, I need to go get all gigabyte, one gig of it. I need to then calculate the hash and check. And if it didn't match, well, then this jerk in P2P world that sent me the wrong file is like, ha ha, I made you download a gig of data and it's wrong, right? And that's, that's where we use the phrase incremental verification is, can I know, hey, I've only downloaded a kilobyte of data and I know that you've sent me a byte that's incorrect, right? And the upside of that is, this is a really necessary uh, precursor for peer-to-peer systems because you want to deal with the sort of adversarial side of things. Out from that, you get this really nice, uh, you usually get this nice property where you can say, hey, just give me a subsection of that. And we can verify that subsection because if you can verify just a piece of a file, well, then if we'd make that piece that you're asking for some middle section of the file, then you get this thing called uh, byte, byte offset seeking. 
And so they're kind of closely related, but the primitive that you really need is the capacity to ha only get a chunk of something and know that the chunk you got is what you asked for. And this is also the same reason why in IPFS as it is now in sort of Kubo and, and JS IPFS and so on, um, we chunk these, uh, you know, whenever you take a file and you represent it as, uh, you know, a, a DAG essentially, then you're chunking it into small chunks that you can sort of move around and verify them as self sort of certifying units. Yeah, we call those chunks blocks in, um, in regular IPFS parlance. Um, we call them chunks inside of Blake 3 because they actually aren't blocks, right? They, these are just literally chunks of a, of, a, of, a whole, of a larger whole that actually don't make sense out of that context. And that's one of the bigger things, right? With Blake 3, we drop the number of CIDs that we talk about by an order of magnitude because we don't actually represent a file that might, in, in regular IPFS problems, we might use a fixed size chunker that takes a 100 megabyte file and cuts it up into 256 kilobyte blocks. Here we're saying, no, that 100 megabyte file gets a single CID. And then we have incremental verification metadata that we transmit separately where those hashes may theoretically, theoretically could be CIDs, but they are never treated that way inside of our. Yeah, and, and the, one of the nice side effects of that is that you can also you basically you don't alter the input uh, data. So whatever exactly. thing you put into Iro, it just you basically calculate all of this necessary metadata in order to do the verification. And you also you can tune that. I believe it's eight percent of whatever input um, um, data. By you default, give. six percent. Yeah. Okay. By default, six percent. And and the setting we use is far lower. It's chunk groups you can get down into the like one percent range. And, then, and, then and I, just... I think it's important to like point that out and kind of dispel that myth. You can get that trick with regular IPFS. We call that um, the file store pattern in, in um, Kubo land. So you can actually do this where you just store the block constructions and the, and the block setups as metadata. The challenge though, is that the metadata overhead is quite high and the construction of that overhead can be quite expensive. By using just a hashing algorithm and in particular Blake 3, which is a highly parallelizable hashing algorithm, uh, we can do, uh, <laughs> our recent tests had ingests of uh, Llama, the, um, the Facebook new machine learning model, which is 140 gigabytes of content uh, is happen is being ingested in roughly 22 seconds on a MacBook Pro. And so oh, wow. like you get really, 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 really fast construction with really low overhead. And a lot of this, again, just stems from the simplicity of using the Blake 3 hashing algorithm uh, sort of uh, exclusively. Gotcha. And in the design doc, I read Iro is in alignment with many common whole, sum, uh, whole file checksum systems. Maybe you could sort of, it seemed like it was hinting at something, potential interoperability with existing systems. What are some of those systems that you had in mind? Are we talking about package managers, Docker registries? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, uh, we could have phrased this a little clearer. Uh, <laughs> the, the idea there is, um, with Iro, it should not be this all or nothing uh, system. We don't want to end up in a world where you have to ingest stuff and keep around this like really thick textbook of metadata anywhere. And so the interoperability story for Iro is you can just content address stuff at rest because you don't need to change the bytes and the metadata overhead is really small. Entire S3 buckets, entire package manager systems, like literally, you know, existing blockchains, if that were necessary, you can just go calculate any, if you want to do incremental ver verification, you keep that bow outboard metadata that Rudiger goes into detail about. And if you want to do, you can just use it, but you also don't need to do that at all. You can just say, I'm going to calculate the Blake through hash of these bytes, and that will equal the thing that is stored in the CID. And so now you don't, you have this really nice property where the ingest into IPFS process is trivial. And so now your interoperability story is just, okay, go point at that. And so this means we can just point, we can give you like outboard metadata and say, hey, go fetch this file from S3. Here is the CID and the, and the incremental verification data. And that'll be passed as a side channel. And now all your data transfer protocol is just an HTTP fetch with this like really clean and transparent interoperability story. And the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of this is, is, is this essentially making, or is the, the logic behind this that you could have smarter clients doing essentially retrieval over HTTP, which everything already supports. Yeah. Yeah. And so as soon as you're, as soon as your client, you know, uh, we really liked back from move the bytes working group. I think, um, uh, Jeropo had a really sort of like bombshell talk that 
drove home a point that a lot of us have been excited about, which is smarter clients is the way to go it, as long as you can do parallelized fetch, right? So let's use that scenario of, hey, I need to get a video file and I happen to know that three people provide it. If the client knows, gets into a position where it knows enough, soon enough, it can efficiently construct and parallelize that query across the three peers that are providing that data. And so the, the example I just just explained to you where it's like, hey, you know, here's an S3 URL and here's this CID and metadata. That CID and metadata is the sort of manifest that you need to understand how that file looks. And if you know about multiple providers, you can do half your fetch via an HTTP call, half via a peer-to-peer -peer connection. You can sort of efficiently construct that however you want, um, not however you want, as, <laughs> as fast as we can possibly ship you a client that'll do it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the sort of hope is we really want to get into that position where we have really smart clients that can do the best, make the best possible choices based on the knowledge that they have locally. And that's really yeah. kind of the heart of doing peer-to-peer -peer stuff, right? Yeah, one final question I guess I have um, regarding the technical details is um, how you, uh, you mentioned sort of this focus on, on mobile devices. Do you really imagine um, in this design that mobile devices can become productive members of the network? And is this, is this sort of like, this is a bit of a throwback for me to high school days when Bluetooth just came around <laughs> and like we would send each other pictures via Bluetooth and we thought it was the coolest thing ever. Like, oh I mean, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but this is kind of like something that sort of speaks to me that like now, you know, you have proprietary, you know, you have airdrop and stuff, but you can't like, it's difficult sending stuff over Bluetooth. But I'm curious, is this like, in, is, is the idea of, because like, Peer-to-peer -peer networks, they're obviously, they're not equal. And I think we've seen that already uh, in the case of, say, IPFS. Even just network reachability is a challenge. Uh, but even if you have, like, network reachability, like an IPv6 works great and you don't have all of these NAT challenges, even then, you know, you have high churn. And so devices come and go and you have resource management on these devices. Um, are you optimizing for this use case? And can you imagine a scenario where these low powered devices can become productive members of the network? Totally. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. I think, I think if you had to prioritize the problems and our research is pointing us really at that churn problem as number one, closely followed by a pretty small uplink as being number two. So we can think about modern Wi-Fi as being capped at basically 200 megabytes a second, right? That's not, the same speed as your and so your phone sitting on your wife even sitting on your wi-fi network which is better than 5g which we're just not even going to touch um is, is yeah can that can we actually make an efficient peer-to-peer -peer citizen out of that device and so you can imagine a graph where the longer the device is online and the better the connection the more useful it can be and so the real challenge with iro is to construct a system that can move as far down that curve as possible where the session time is as short as possible and as short as reasonable and the number, but through that shorter session time, you get a better, you're, there are theoretically more nodes available, right? And so there isn't any major magic here that is different from how IPFS works today. We still imagine using a DHT, we still imagine using content address systems, and we still have to do um, a whole bunch of natural traversal magic to get a really reliable connection infrastructure. With that said, the thing that I think we've learned the most over the last five years is really just how important it is to solve for this churn problem and to start thinking about session lengths that are on the order of seconds. And that's really where we've been spending a lot of our time researching. And we're also kind of tuning the use cases. We're not just saying, hey, we're going to do, we're going to serve web pages from mobile phones. Like that's not, <laughs> it's not a reasonable thing. But mobile games and mobile game assets, yeah, we can do that, right? Because now we have really big asset sizes, really long session length because a, a user is spending a lot of time online. Social media, right? You've got a whole bunch of people browsing a lot of rich media content, often, unfortunately, <laughs> glued to our phones for long periods of time and so we there are very real very actionable use cases where you can align the scale of these networks we've got hundreds of thousands millions of devices playing these games on these social networks so we can drive even like a five percent utility out of those these are major league scaling wins right and so that's really what we're aimed at 
And that means doing a whole bunch of GAC under the hood that I won't bore everybody with on, we'll go into technical details in some other venue, but uh, that's the, that's the problem we're trying to solve for. And we think that there is a sort of postage stamp size landing zone where we can create this really lovely, really efficient network that is content addressed and high churn tolerant. Um, and that's, that's the goal. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing how the pie grows, the IPFS pie. Um, <laughs> what is, uh, w w how can folks get involved if we have viewers who are watching this? Uh, what's the timeline and um, when can users start playing with this? So I was interactive development. Uh, we have a release out today that you can play with. Uh, the, there are three major pillars that we have to solve for. Data transfer, check, we've got that. Reliable connections, that's the thing that we're shipping next, which is, hey, can we connect to you even if you're behind network address translation, even if you're behind a corporate firewall? That's shipping um, next. Following that, the last holy grail element is a content routing uh, solution. So, hey, given any hash, tell me who has that hash. Um, that'll be the last thing to come online. So we expect this sort of like parity with the existing IPFS system to exist kind of in the middle of this year, probably late um, Q, Q2, Q3 this year, uh, or Q, late, late Q3 to sometime in Q3 type timeframe. But the data transfer thing you can play with right now, we have a thing that is easily saturating one gigabit connections and is ingesting 140 gigabyte directories with uh, in like sub 30 seconds. So happy to have people to play with those aspects, but if you need content routing, you're gonna have to wait a couple of months. Got it. Brendan, thank you so much. I dropped the link into the chat. That's iro.computer. Um, and everything you're doing is open source too. So uh, folks are interested, they can dive into the Rust code base. Anything else you want to share before we wrap? No, thanks so much for hosting this, Daniel. It's really it's been great chatting. Thank you for coming on. Hope to have you here soon. Um, and maybe with some more progress updates on uh, iro. Thanks. All the best. OK. Next, we have our uh, next guest, and that is Robin Berjon. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring you Robin Berjon. So welcome, Robin. Uh, you're heading governance and standards at Protocol Labs, and you've been working on making the web better for a couple of decades. And, and you've done a lot of work on standards and privacy. And you're really passionate about turning the web into a space that is operated collectively and cooperatively. Is is that a good way to put things, Robin? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think, uh, I think that's that that is indeed a, a better way to put it than than I would have put it myself. So so thank you. Um, um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, sort of like in the late '90s, I discovered this this web thing, and I thought it was wonderful but it had a few problems and I figured I'd spend you know six months or a year working on fixing those problems and then I'd be done with it and figure out what I wanted to do um, in life but it looks like the list of problems has only lengthened um, and so 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 here we are today and uh, tell me something Robin so Tell me, you told us a little bit about your background in the 90s. That was a really exciting time for the internet, right? It was this like new publishing revolution. It was almost like a Gutenberg uh, V2. Um, how did you come to work on IPFS? Because you were working on the, uh, you were working for like W3C, I believe. Uh, you had some association in the New York Times. What sort of attracted you to IPFS and, and how did you come to work on it? I, I mean, it's 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 IPFS and, and the entire ecosystem around it that I found extremely attractive. Um, I, I, as you said, in the, in the 90s, we could really feel um, a, a vibe of you know transformation happening uh, thanks to the web, thanks to our ability to to publish and, and be heard and 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 be connected to others and and, and have good conversations. Um, and I mean, one way to think about it is is uh, I was at an event with with Corey a few days ago, and he was like, you know, I'm old, I'm over fifty, and and so you, you you've heard this, 
uh, before and you expected, but it really was better before. It used to be, it used to be better. Um, and, and, and he's right. Uh, in the, in the, the web in the 90s might not have had the capabilities of today's web. Um, you know, JavaScript was very limited. Uh, you, you really couldn't do that much. But it also had, um, you know, it was much more egalitarian. It was, it was, it, it was much more collective. And I think returning to this, bringing it back, but back in a way that is capture resistant, um, that is properly governed, um, that, you know, pushes people, uh, pushes power out, out to the edges is something that we need to do and we need to build into today's web. And, a, you know, IPFS is a key component of that. Um, uh, you, you do need that, that, that content addressable layer um, in order to build like, you know, self-certifying systems and, and to, to sort of break, um, you know, the, the system in which the, the server controls everything and as users, you are you are basically powerless. And so, so yeah, uh, IPFS, I, I, I feel, is 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 where these changes are are, are happening, and, and it, it's a foundational layer for that. So that that's immediately fascinating to me. Yeah, and and you mentioned uh, this property of IPFS being self-certifying. Can you explain a bit what that means? Sure. Um, so uh, basically, it, it, it's. It, one way to think about it is in terms of authority and and i think we don't we don't spend a lot of time thinking about these issues because you know, stuff like names and and like who decides how to name things um tend to be like so basic and so automatic that that we don't we don't you know think about them much but if you read the, the you know a lot of the early architectural documents um of of http and of, of the web uh, there was this very very strong idea that DNS delegates uh, authority to a server, and on that server, uh, you know, whoever operates it absolutely owns that space. And they own that space in terms of like naming things, in terms of like what resources, resp uh, um, you know, can be used to reply to what names. And it, it, we don't, I don't, I don't think we we completely understand how strong that belief in federation and like in like my server is my land and this is my property and and. I'm the king of that property. Um, it was at the time, uh, but if you look at the issues they had um, and the discussions they had, for instance, when people started creating names in other people's websites. So if you think of like robots txt, which you know as a standard creates a name in everyone else's web, or stuff like the dot well known or favicon dot ico, um, the way people talked about that at the time was expropriation. You're basically coming to my property and stealing names from me and stealing, you know, my ability to name resources. And, you know, this might seem a bit abstract, but it really mapped to how the web ended up working, right? It's like you are basically visiting, when you visit a website, you're visiting someone else's property. And as a user, you have no authority over what happens there. What we mean by self-certifying is things that carry their own authority with themselves. So with IPFS, because it's content addressed, you don't need someone else to tell you, you know, what content this is um, and 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 how, how it's retrieved. The 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 name is the is derived directly from the content, and therefore you can interact with content in a way that's not mediated by this idea that it is necessarily someone else's property or that you have to abide by someone else's rules to 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 interact with it. And that you know that means a lot of power gets pushed back. To, to people, and it goes very well with you know um, having having a self sovereign identity and a whole number of other properties that that basically again push power back to people. I see. So, in your understanding, would you consider say because DNS, while it is an open system and you can use it, you know, to your liking, you can run your own DNS server and then you know allocate names as you like, you know, in the sort of the modern kind of like application of it, it's really, I mean. You have the TLD and you have the ICANN and, and you have like these authorities and, and these organizations that are trying to manage what is, I think, a scarce resource, right? You have only so many names that you can fit under the .com TLD. How do you think about you? Because you mentioned identity and I was very curious to hear your thoughts about how do you see sort of human friendly self-certified uh, self-certifying naming do you think that's even a realistic vision or do you imagine I, that in any system you would require some level of uh, of like essentially organizations to manage these collective resources that are scarce 
that, that's a very good question. I mean, naming naming is 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 very hard. I forget who said that that the, the two hardest problems in computer science are are naming and cache and validation. And and I honestly think cache and validation isn't that hard compared to naming. Um, so I, I don't think that's been solved yet. Um, at least if you want the names to be readable and, and as you said, human friendly. If you want something better than you know an IPNS uh, hash of a key. Uh, or something that delegates to DNS, um, it, it hasn't been solved uh, completely yet. That being said, there are people working on a variety of, of systems that ha I, I do think, you know, give me hope that the, 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 this problem will be solved or at least improved uh, soon. So for instance, um, at the next IPFS thing, uh, there's gonna be a presentation about um, Blaine Cook's uh, name name system, which uh, tries to address some of these issues. Uh, there's also been work around various um, pet naming or local naming uh, conventions. So I know I know the um, the uh, the subconscious people have uh, a system where you can you can have your local pet name that map uh, everything maps to CIDs, and then you can do like your local name dot someone else's name dot someone else's name, and so you can eventually create a path across the network that goes that goes somewhere else. Um, so. Uh, these these problems are being being worked on, and I, I I do think that we can find a collectively governed way of 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 addressing them. Yeah. So tell us a bit maybe about what you do uh, at Protocol Labs um, for IPFS. Uh, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm working on a couple of things. Um, one of them is is you know making sure that IPFS can integrate well and bridge well with the rest of the web. Um, the idea is is really we want to make it a great additional load bearing component for for web things for everyday normal normal web things and so that means for instance integrating it in, into browser into browsers integrating it into into the rest of of the, of the web stack um and so as part of that you know uh working with people who 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 implement things in browsers but also representing protocol labs at at the w3c sit on the board of directors there um, and yeah, really trying to build sort of bi-directional awareness and, 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 and bridges where, where possible. Um, and also more specifically on IPFS itself, I'm, I'm, I'm working um, on, on specs and governance. So, you know, working with others to, to, to put together some specs websites and, you know, have a, have a nice system for publishing specs. Um, really the idea is to go a bit beyond the kind of like markdown system um, you know, just marked down on GitHub that, that we have today. Um, still keeping that on the authoring side, we want to keep it easy for people writing specs, but like, you know, Im improve the, the, the general stature. Um, and also a number of like distributed web policy things, um, you know, looking into like how how privacy, how safety, how content filtering should, should be governed um, in, in distributed systems. I see. That's a... Sounds like an interesting thing. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about why is it that specs and standards are so important for um, IPFS and, and and the web in in, in general. Yeah, that, I mean that that's that's a great question. We we can we can learn from experience, uh, you know, from from the early web. Initially, it was sort of like vague standards. If you look at like HTTP 09, I think it's described in like maybe seven or eight paragraphs. Um, like the whole thing, um, and and HTML itself was just like, well, yeah, this is vaguely an HTML syntax, and here's a list of tags, and you know, more or less what they do. That was it, right? And and that worked well for many years, but then you got to a point where you know browsers just started adding features and features and features, and then everyone had to copy the the the, the most, you know whichever browser was on top at that at that point, but people copied with bugs. And so, and so then you had bugs and copies of bugs and copies of copies of bugs. And you ended up with this sort of like big organic thing that, I mean, it worked, it was successful, uh, but at the same time, it was really hard to use and build content for and build, build experiences in. And at that point, focusing on, on interop became really, really important. And I think the idea here <clears throat> is to avoid that same uh, situation uh, developing in the IPFS ecosystem, we already have sort of this um, tendency to believe that that building IPFS is building compatibility with Kubo, 
Uh, and basically, unless you're, you know, you're at parity with Kugel on everything, and you do everything exactly the way that Kugel does it, uh, then you're not doing IPFS. And that's that's obviously not true. And you know, we heard it right before from from Brendan, who gave gave a really good example of of, of how you know they, they they've been exploring um, all these new ways of of of, of using IPFS that are absolutely fascinating. Um, and so I think having a strong foundational layer of standards. First, tells people how to implement things uh, in a way that's interoperable and won't create those kind of like bugs and copies of bugs issues. But it also sort of dispels this idea that everything has to copy Kubo. Kubo is wonderful, but it's one way of thinking about IPFS. And if we want um, IPFS, and we do want IPFS to go into all kinds of different environments and to uh, address all kinds of different use cases, not all of these can use Kubo. And so there needs to be multiple ways of doing that. And so having the specs as a foundation and as a layer of, uh, of agreement really helps move us in that direction. And what is the process for writing these uh, specs and, and maintaining them look like? Uh, I imagine that this also touches, I mean, the very governance of an open source project. So maybe we can start with like how that looks like for uh, the IPFS specs. And what are some of the lessons of like effective governance that could be maybe extrapolated from it? Sure. I mean, so uh, the, the 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 IPFS uh, process is pretty straightforward. Um, you can you can go look at the um, the, the IPIP process. Um, basically, you know, it depends on on the kind of change. But if if you're talking about a major change, you 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 know submit a, an improvement proposal. Um, along along with, the, with with a spec, it doesn't have to be super formal. Currently, the standards aren't very formal. We're probably going to make them, uh, you know, incrementally a little bit more formalized, so that so 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 as to avoid some um, some ambiguities. But really, you know, if if you look at the few IPIPs that are out there, and you read the process, which is I think two pages long, you'll have a pretty good idea of um, uh, of what of what needs to be done. Now. I think the question that uh, certainly I, I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night, but but that that I, I feel that we need to really get to inside of say the coming year is at what point do we need to scale up this process a, a little bit? Um, what I mean by that is in terms of success, uh, 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 you know, successful governance, the the difficulty is not. Um, finding a, a model that works at the scale at which you are. I think the current IPFS uh, system, you know, it works well. The problem is how do you scale when something becomes successful? Um, because the, the, there's a level at which, um, you know, basically having some common rough norms is sufficient. Um, you know, you, I don't want the other people in there to think that I'm a jerk, so I'm going to behave well. Um, and, and that's enough, you know, that's basically enough enforcement and enough power. But as soon as you start getting like large companies involved, maybe a lot of money riding on something, maybe conflicting interest, you know, increasingly large, large companies. And again, we've seen that in HTTP uh, quite, quite, quite strongly. Then, uh, you know, a, a, a process that only relies on, on norms and on, on people not wanting to be perceived as, as, as a bad person by others eventually breaks down. Because, you know, on one side, you have a job and you have like a whole bunch of other people that you're working with and they think you're doing the right thing. Unity thinks you're doing the wrong thing, but that's not that's not enough. You could go like, well, I, I think my people are, are are more correct. And so you start to need to build um, stronger governance and stronger enforcement mechanisms and stronger requirements for consensus and ramping that up. And so that, that you know, that there's not one uh, one solution and just one way of doing it. But it, it's 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 basically the we don't want to do it too early because then you start creating process that's administrative and bureaucratic and everyone hates that. But you don't want to do it too late because otherwise you're just like giving away the entire process to whichever company is the strongest. So that's that's the balance that we're going to have to try to navigate. Yeah, and I think this is maybe a good leeway uh, to uh, talk about how folks can get involved in the IPFS spec process. Uh, what is sort of the relevant thing to know? Um, maybe you can give, I mean, you mentioned the IPIPs, which is the lightweight sort of um, proposal process that we have. Um, but yeah, in general, how, how, how can folks get involved and when would they get involved? Because in many situations, I think there's also 
no need for folks to get involved in the spec process. You know, sometimes you're just trying to get something done and that doesn't mean you need to start diving into specs. And maybe you can also clarify w when is the moment to actually get involved in specs? Yeah, that, 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 that's a very good question. I mean, hey, well, first, you could get involved because you like specs. Some people are like that. They're kind of weird. Uh, I'm one of them, but you know, they, 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 specs can, can provide interesting challenges in themselves as, as artifacts. So that's one reason to do it. But I would say more generally, there, I would say there are two primary reasons why you would want to get involved in the process. One is um, you, there's a significant new feature, new, new piece of functionality that you want not just your own personal implementation to support, but others as well. And so in that case, you know, say, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, any, any new uh, any new feature, I mean, Brenda was talking about like, like um, uh, Blake 3, for instance, I think, you know, something like that would, would, would require some degree of specification, that would be something that 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 could get us want to do something like that, bringing a spec forward. Um, it, it is a great way. It helps if you have implementation experience with it, because that way you can you, you will know what needs to be specified. But it's also good to, to to start sharing and getting feedback relatively early. The other case in which you want to get involved, and that's probably more common, um, is when you notice that there's an interoperability issue. And so you know you you have a bunch of implementations and you're trying to do the same thing in in two or more of them, and you realize that they're all doing they're all doing something different and and that's different in a way that breaks something. And in those cases, that the primary things that you can focus on. One is, yes, in, improving the spec, because normally if things disagree, it will mean that the spec either isn't written or is ambiguous or has a problem of some kind. So focusing on that, helping fix that, um, that is something that can be a small intervention. Uh, you know, you don't have to become like a standards wonk. And, and know everything about writing well, even just like filing the issue in the first place is already super helpful on that on that front. But the other part of it is is contributing to a test suite. And that's often something that developers can be more familiar with and find more more rewarding. Um, so that there's you know that there's work ramping up on a shared test suite for for, for IPFS. It's it is starting now, uh, but it's starting to look uh, really nice already. And, you know, a spec is only ever as good as the test suite that tests it, because that's, that's what makes things real, right? You can have all the words you want, but if there aren't tests to match them, it's just words. And so, so, you know, uh, it, it, whenever you find an interrupt problem coming to the test system and saying like, well, this isn't tested, maybe we should test that because then people will do the same thing is also a great way to contribute to, you know, things that are overall standards and specification artifacts. I see. Thank you. Um, and so with that, I think it's maybe a good note. Um, you're uh, going to be involved in one of the tracks at IPFS Think. And maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that. I believe it's the standards, governance, and deep web policy track uh, that you're yep, going to be chairing. Yep. Yes, absolutely. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, I've been talking a lot about, you know, what I think the governance should be and, and what, what, what things people could do. But I, I think that track is um, is really a good place for people to bring governance problems to the community. It's like, if you think that this or that part of IPFS should be better governed, what are problems that, that you can imagine happening in the future or that you are seeing today, uh, please bring them there. And this is, you know, the, the scope is broad. It's like technical standards, um, you know, for interop at the IPFS level, for instance, but it's also integration into uh, with, between IPFS and other technologies for which we also need interop, um, uh, you know, functionality. And it's also more broadly uh, how to how to fit into the the the, the wider uh, policy landscape. You know, we're hearing a lot from operators about uh, how do I handle this GDPR thing or or that DMC thing or you know this this other kind of problem and uh you know get it is is just like yolo i, I don't care uh, i'm gonna ignore it but i think i think a lot of operators are, are now really wanting to have shared solutions to to these issues and so that's also something that we want to govern together and and, and standardize across you know working on bad bites and things like that um so yeah all, all, all of these things are, are in scope for the spec submit talks come talk to us. Um, I think we're going to have a great time. Great. And yeah, this is also a good moment to just plug IPFS thing in general. So IPFS thing, in case you haven't heard, is uh, taking place in Brussels, Belgium, 
Um, this is also a chance to meet uh, Robin, uh, Ryan, I believe, is going to be there, and also Brendan, who was uh, here earlier. So this is really like an event for the IPFS implementers community, and it's everything from talks, workshops, discussion circles, and, and hacking time, um, really all focused on, on advancing IPFS. So... Um, uh, this is your opportunity, and I'll drop a link uh, to the website where you can uh, learn more about this if you haven't. Um, Thing.io. Yeah, so I just dropped the link there. Uh, Robin, anything else you want to share? It, can we do, do we have something that we can share with regards to the new specs um, website that uh, you've been working on, or is that premature? It, it's... It's for maybe by a couple of days. I was hoping to have it for today, but, but it hasn't completed ship. But it, it, you know, people can can already open it in a tab and then already refresh at some point. Uh, Specs.ipfs.tech um, is where it's going to be at. There's already a draft there, but it's 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 very early days. But we're going to start seeing um, actual specs dropping there um, within within days. Um, so yes, please please go go check it out. And um, and yeah, thanks a lot, Daniel, for for having me. It's been it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on, uh, Robin. Hope to have you here soon. And uh, yeah, all the best. Take care. Okay, uh, we're now moving on to our uh, final guest for today. That is uh, Ryan Plouche. So with that, I'm going to bring Ryan to the stage. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, Daniel. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Do you mind if I give you a quick introduction just in case the audience isn't familiar with some of your work? So yeah, go for it. You are a Texas-based engineer working with Little Bear Labs, currently working on the IPFS in Space project. And this is a project that is focusing on applying content addressable data and tooling to satellite communication. And your background includes shipping code for inventory scanners, in-car GPS units and open source flight software. So you really have this uh, ever-growing love for pushing bytes and doing low-level things with Rust. And this is, I believe, what brought you to work on this IPFS in space project. Yeah, you got it. That, that's all that needs to be said, you know? <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and how you actually came to work on IPFS specifically and IPFS in, in, in space? Because I believe you've been involved with like, first of all, the Rust community for quite a while. I've seen a bunch of your talks, um, I think from RustConf. Yeah, yeah. So my, my background has been pretty firmly in the embedded space, working with a lot of different devices that run some form of embedded Linux. Um, so really need to get to work in this behind the scenes code that maybe people don't see, but supports a lot of things that are visible. Um, my last company was pretty deep into what we would call like the new space industry and spent about four years there working on this open source flight software, which was obviously really cool to get to work on and also gave me some really interesting perspectives on the challenges of developing software for, for space. So my CEO and boss at that company, Marshall, actually came to work for Cloudcoin Foundation. And I believe he was like part of the original team that came up with the idea for this mission and really helped like kick it off early on. Um, so my company, Little Bear Labs, probably about a year ago was starting to work with protocol labs and trying to figure out what does it look like to work on the libp2p side. And the space project came up and it seemed like a really natural and happy coincidence of a fit that I could take up this project from Marshall and kind of pick up where he left off and just a really nice transition there. Um, I actually got to meet with Marshall in person because we live in the same city and really talk shop about what had been done and where this project was going. So that made it just a, a really nice transition. And with the similar backgrounds, um, I was excited to once again, get to work on sending rust up into space. Yeah. And I mean, could you actually tell us a little bit more about what does it mean to be doing IPFS in space? What are some of the challenges there and what is it like using the Rust stack? Yeah, yeah. So when I think about the project that we're currently working on, there's almost like two different projects here. So one of them is supporting this demonstration of IPFS, 
in space that you guys are working with Lockheed on. And that obviously is super cool. And we want that to go really well. And we want to make sure that we were demonstrating IPFS in a way that's like really meaningful and working. Um, so the other is like more of a long-term view of like, how do we create a foundation, like a base for people to build on top of for using IPFS in space so that they don't have to start over from scratch. You know, we have some tools or even a system that they can build on top of when they start to address more complex parts of this particular problem. So this initial demo is going to be a relatively simple, like point to point demonstration of using IPFS to transfer content addressable data back and forth between a ground station and a satellite. And that's one satellite and one ground station, which is why I say simple, you know, we're able to eliminate a lot of the complexity of like peer to peer things and focus just on the basics of shipping content addressable data. So as of today, almost all the functionality required for that mission is actually complete. And we're working on like edge cases and hardening things up so that when we go to actually test this on hardware, uh, there's no big surprises. So we have a new IPFS node kind of up here to Cubo, and that's named Micelli, similar to um, the fungus that spreads and communicates really well over long distances. So Micelli is our new node software, and we have a reference implementation for allowing Micelli to speak over radios and a command line tool for forming the commands that you would use to control these Micelli nodes. And Micelli and the protocol that it speaks has been designed in a symmetrical fashion so that we deploy the same software in space as we deploy on the ground system. And they speak essentially the same way. So it makes testing very easy and makes the system um, fairly simple to reason about because we don't have like super specialized software on either end. Now that the demo obviously is the first priority, but that's kind of shaped the way that we think about this long-term foundation and how we build it. And the process we're going through is essentially starting with how do we ship something that just works and then we'll layer on pieces of functionality addressing more complex concerns. It would be very easy to get caught up in these really, really interesting questions like how does peer to peer work in space or what is the best alternative to bit swap to use over a radio or what is the DHT going to look like in a satellite constellation? But the reality is that right now, as I work on this, I'm not the best person to answer those questions. And those questions aren't actually relevant to the demo that's being worked on this year. So we're kind of punting those questions down into the future. And for now, um, building a foundation that will work for the demo and give people a great place to start when it's the time to address those questions. So looking at this year, like the priorities for the project are one, making sure the demo is, success, is a success and two, building this like realistic and flexible foundation for the future of exploring and solving IPFS and space questions. What is it like to be using the Rust stack for IPFS? Um, I mean, uh, Brendan was mentioned a bit of their journey uh, with uh, Iro. How is that sort of, how is that? I mean, you know, they always say you, you got to pick the right tool for the job and sometimes the best tool is the one that you're familiar with. Um, yeah. how, how has that been with Rust and, and sort of approaching these? Because I imagine that it's quite challenging. You're trying to build here a solid foundation and a big part of that is that you're having to think about multiple layers of the IS, or the OSI or the TCP IP model, right? You know, you, you, we have this model to provide encapsulation so that most developers can really focus on their layer of the stack. Like for example, most developers today, you know, they're working on HTTP servers. They don't really need to think too much about TCP and, 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 and how things or ethernet or how, you know, packets are rooted around the, the web. That's just a different layer of abstraction. But when you approach this, you know, IPFS arguably is sitting on top of transport protocols. It's an application layer, uh, technology, and it's relying on, you know, a full stack, a full network stack below it. Um, you're in, you know, if you're speaking about, you mentioned, for example, doing a radio communication where you're actually doing this transmission over 
like radio communication, you know, in your testing environment, you mentioned you also have all of these, uh, uh, like, uh, I believe like SDR software controlled radio. Um, and, uh, and so I guess my question is like, what is it like to be thinking about so many layers of the stack at the same time? Yeah, it's a great question. So like you said, most developers, when they're developing web apps, they're not thinking about HTTP and how it works under the covers. They're thinking about maybe which HTTP verb do I need to use, or maybe sometimes it's just which function in my framework do I need to call that then delegates HTTP under the covers. And that is certainly the future that we're reaching for with, I think, IPFS in general, and specifically this IPFS and space project. How do we get it to where um, people building space missions aren't thinking about IPFS, they're just using IPFS under the covers. The reality is we're not there yet today, right? We have to build that under the covers part before people can have those healthy abstractions. So when it's come to like actually building this and thinking about the different networking layers, um, I find it to be very satisfying and interesting. You know, we all know about HTTP and TCP and IP to a certain extent because we just use them, but usually we don't have the opportunity to peel back those layers and see what's going on underneath. So it's a privilege to get to work in a problem where I have to peel back those layers to even see what's happening and maybe try to try to switch them out. And in a lot of ways, it's like surprising and humbling to see all the work that's been done and all the different ways people try to solve different networking problems. So this is a, this is a different sort of problem maybe than we've had to address before. So we have to think about what is the new idea here that we, we, we need. So in this, um, for this project in particular, like we're, we're talking over radio, this radio link could have been MTU anywhere from like 60 bytes to normal 1500 bytes. Um, we don't know how reliable it will be. It could be one way, it could be two ways. So TCP is like obviously off the table. It would just be so upset with us. We tried to use TCP over a radio link like this in the worst case, so we can't do that. Um, so what we did is in the assumption, we we were able to assume that we get a network stack on the spacecraft and on the ground station. Maybe those network stacks can't talk directly to each other, but at least we can use that within the system itself to talk to the different components. So we made the assumption that everyone will be able to speak UDP, so my celly will speak UDP, UDP doesn't really enforce much on us in general. That means it's our responsibility to build in things like retries and such on top of it. But really that's an advantage because then we can build those things in a way that's tuned specifically for the radio and for the environment that we're operating on. So some assumptions that we're making is we don't assume what the radio is or how it works, um, but we know the system operator does. So all we do is ask them to build a simple UDP bridge over the radio. And then we tunnel all of our protocol specific information over these UDP packets. Um, that simplifies what the, the system operator has to do. They know about the radio. UDP is really simple. They just translate back and forth between the radio and UDP. And then as we iterate on the like internal protocol design, they don't actually need to change anything on their end because we're still stuffing all of our data into UDP packets. So essentially invisible to the system, doesn't cause any overhead when our internal APIs change, as long as we're always speaking UDP. And I think that assumption hopefully will carry us a long way and make things really simple, whether we're on like a kind of janky spacecraft with a pretty unreliable radio or maybe a higher end spacecraft with a really reliable link. Either way, these UDP packets are going to go over the radio in a way that the system operator deems best, and our protocol will just be ferried back and forth. And what frequencies are we sort of uh, talking about here for transmission? What kind of waves are these? Oh, that is a great question that I honestly don't have a good answer to. My understanding of how these things work is that for each mission, um, whoever's like running this mission has to like go to the FCC, find a uh, wavelength that is like open and available for the specific ge geography where their satellite will be. 
and then basically talk to all these countries and all their governing bodies and make sure it's okay for them to have that wavelength during this time over this geography. So it's like a real mess trying to trying to figure that stuff out. And I think I'm really happy that the chosen abstraction for this project means I don't have to worry about that. I let the system operator worry about it. I just ask them if they can send and receive UDP packets and then all of their legal troubles are hidden behind UDP. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of also NDAs involved in this kind of project because of the nature of, you know, these satellites and so on. Um, but generally from a, like a design perspective is the wavelength the kind of thing that can impact a lot of other parameters that you're working with, like MTUs? Maybe you can also like mention a, a, what an MTU is, right? Yeah, yeah. So we've been using this, this phrase MTU. So this is, I think, maximum transmission unit. And just to give some context, so I have a little lab set up on my desk where I've been testing this and that's a Raspberry Pi with a radio hooked up to it and then a peer radio on my computer. And the MTU for those radios is 60 bytes, which means that at the most I can send 60 bytes at a time. So underneath everything that I send, I need to be sending 60 byte chunks, which are coherent and can be assembled back together on the other side. Um, that is an interesting limitation. Um, I was able to get my CIDs down, I think to like 30 or 40 bytes. So if like every, packet on my radio was a IPFS block that would give me about 20 bytes of data per 40 bytes of CID, um, which is an absurd amount of overhead. So that, you know, we've had to do some chunking way below that to decrease the amount of overhead and actually get a little bit of efficiency out of this link. Now back to your question, Daniel, yes, there are a ton of like variables that affect a radio and how we communicate it over it. There's the MTU size, there's the reliability. Are they one way? Are they two way? Those are like the main things that I think about. And some of these elements, um, we can work them into configuration. Like the MTU size is something we can configure. Or if we know there's going to be latency in the back and forth, we can configure that. But some things we can't just like configure and tune on a dial, like how reliable the radio is going to be. Um, it would be really hard to have like, you know, low, medium, high, uh, reliability settings. Um, so many things change based on the reliability. So what we've done is started with the assumption that we're just working with the really bad radio. Um, it's pretty unreliable. Maybe it's one way. Um, another element of this is that the radio on the satellite and the ground station side are not always in communication. Usually you communicate over something called a pass and. Um, let's assume we get like five minutes every few hours. So we're not communicating very often. So everything is pitted against us. How do we build a protocol that can make the most of that time, make the most of that link and um, work somewhat well over that? So I started with these kind of bare, bare minimum assumptions. Like it's going to be real bad. If it's really good, that's great. But if it's really bad, it still needs to work. And what this has meant is that for the data protocol itself, it is needed to start out as something that's really simple. It has very few expectations about maybe receiving responses. This idea of like request response assumes that um, I'll take action if you acknowledge my action and maybe tell me what to do. Um, and I've had to like eliminate a lot of those, those assumptions and think like, okay, maybe I'm not gonna hear very much back. How mm -hmm. do I give the other side the best shot at getting all the data that I have or getting the right data, even if I don't hear very much back. Um, so in general, as I've been thinking about how we form the messages, how we form the responses, those are the assumptions that have been in my mind. So it's, yeah, it's very much like application level code trying to overcome some of these link level problems. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Uh, I guess this is one of those things where the, the power of content addressing really, it's like, this is a real test of like content addressing. I mean, sure, there's always a lot of optimizations that can be done and, you know, maybe the work that Iro, the Iro team is doing is, is gonna like yield some of those like more efficient representations and, you know, eliminate the need for, you know, 
you know, representing the data as a completely discrete, um, you know, content addressed uh, uh, representation of it. But uh, I, I really look forward to see how this pans out, you know, with satellite communication, because, I mean, at some point, you know, you just can't rely on there being a single point that you can always reach, right? It's If you have moving objects, I imagine that you want to have basically, like, leverage the ability to fetch data from wherever it can possibly come and doing yeah. that in a way that is verified. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this first, you know, demonstration mission gives us the opportunity to show like, hey, we can do simple content address things, but the real power will come out whenever you're dealing with a constellation of satellites or a network of ground stations. That's really where you get to pull these big levers of content address data and stitch things back together across multiple years. Yeah. Um, so what is the timeline for this project? Um, when can we imagine this will be a launch aboard a satellite? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. So like I said earlier, there's the two projects at play here, right? There's the demo mission and then there's the longer term building this foundation. And I'm sure everyone is much more interested in the when will this actually get into space side of things. So I'm going to give you basically a non-answer here. Um, one of the big realities that I've personally observed in the space industry is that schedules tend to slip. Um, that just happens all the time to everyone. So I believe the original launch date for this demo was this summer. And I, I can't say this for sure, but I would be surprised personally if that summer date holds, just knowing what I know about space in general and what tends to happen. And I would more realistically expect a fall launch. But... I'm not the official official schedule maker here, so don't don't take me at this. And um, I think I'm really waiting with everyone else to hear on the final dates for this thing. Now, for the longer term project, um, the software is in a state right now where anyone could clone this code and get a Raspberry Pi and some radios and actually start using it to send data over the radio using Micelli. Um, it's at a good enough state that it, it is usable. There's obviously a lot more to build on, like the whole peer-to-peer -peer concept, but the foundation is there and usable. And this requires uh, knowledge of Rust or these uh, sort of things that you could package and run without too much uh, intimate understanding of how it's uh, working under the hood? Yeah, that's a great question. So the project itself is all written in Rust. Um, the way it's structured is the Micelli nodes are standalone binaries similar to Cubo, so they could just be built and run. And there's also this command line utility for forming commands that you use to control the nodes, and that also is a standalone binary. So if you can figure out enough Rust to build these projects and run them, that's all you need to know to actually start using it. Obviously, if you want to extend it or start implementing new features, then knowing Rust is going to be a requirement. But just for the actual usage of it, you just would need to know how to build the Rust projects. Gotcha. Great. Uh, Ryan, it's been wonderful having you uh, join and tell us a little bit more. I really look forward to close uh, to, to following this more closely. I also dropped the yeah, link so in the chat. Um, and uh, anything else you want to share before we wrap? Yeah, so I, I really have to echo your plug for IPFS thing and I will also be leading a track there on device networks. Um, so that is like squarely in the area of what this project falls into, which is pushing IPFS or forms of IPFS into different embedded spaces. So I would love to hear from all you hardware hackers that are using IPFS about your different ideas and what you want to do. And, you know, maybe we could have like a hack day on one of the uncomp days where we all bring our different weird, you know, embedded devices and see if we can get IPFS running on them and talking to each other. I think something like that would be really cool. So yeah, be, be sure to check out Thing and all that's going on there. Yeah, you heard Ryan. So here's the link, 2023.ipfs-thing.io. Um, Ryan, it's been great having you. I uh, hope to have you here soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. Okay, uh, we're almost... Uh, over, but I would like to plug a bunch of uh, updates from the ecosystem. So uh, we've had a bunch of releases. I mentioned obviously IPFS things. So let me just share my screen here. 
I'll share, there we go. So as I mentioned, IPFS thing, you can check out the website here. These are all the different tracks that we have and the schedules will be going up uh, in the coming days. Uh, also, you can submit a talk um, if you're interested in speaking. Next, we have the Kubo release. So, oh, I just realized that I'm not even sharing my screen, excuse me. Okay, that should work a bit better. Yes, so I'll make, I'll zoom in a little bit. So as I mentioned, IPFS link, this is the website. This is the schedule. Um, have a look, submit your talk. Kubo was just released three days ago and with it, there's some improvements to the resource manager, the P2P resource manager. Some of the commands have been merged into a single uh, IPFS swarm resources. It used to be sort of grouped under two different sub commands. Um, so that's a, a bit of a DX improvement and we have uh, documentation. Another thing which I'm particularly excited about is uh, IPNS, uh, signed IPNS um, record response format from the gateway. So when you run a gateway now um, and you upgrade to Kubo 0.19, then you can actually get the raw IPNS record um, from uh, using HTTP, which means that you can verify, do like verified resolution of IPNS records. Um, as you may be familiar, if you have an IPNS name and you put it into like a gateway URL, then you basically rely on the uh, IPFS node to do the IPNS resolution and then to just serve you whatever SID it's pointing at. Uh, with this, you're just doing the IPNS resolution stage. So it also potentially shortens the time. Obviously it doesn't give you back the SID, but this can help, you know, if you're just debugging, if you're just trying to debug uh, IPNS resolution, I mean, it's quite common for folks to uh, look up an IPNS record and they're getting an older version of it or whatnot. So this really makes it very easy, just even from the browser to um, do this uh, verification of the IPNS record. Um, and we're also deprecating one of the IPFS pub sub commands. Um, if you are relying on uh, this API that IPFS that Kubo provided, I highly recommend you look at this uh, release note and, and some of the rationale for it. The TLDR is Kubo will continue to use uh, PubSub for IPNS propagation and it still uses libp2p under the hood and libp2p continues to support uh, gossip sub and PubSub. Um, the main thing is that it's very hard to map a whole decentralized PubSub protocol onto an HTTP API. And there were many issues that arose with that. And this is why we think it's it's best for us to sort of deprecate this API and instead recommend users um, to use uh, the libp2p gossip sub API directly. Um, we're gonna have some exciting demos coming up soon on that. Um, if you're interested in getting sort of a sneak peek at what we have in store, um, just look for the universal connectivity repo in the libp2p org. I won't share any more at this point because it's just a bit too early, um, but just thought I should mention this. Um, yeah, so Gossip Sub is here to stay. Uh, it is, uh, you know, keeping, I believe, the Polkadot network. Uh, it's being used for the uh, consensus uh, of, of Polkadot and uh, also by the consensus clients of Ethereum, so Ethereum 2. Post merge is relying on gossip sub to propagate its uh, messages across the network, and uh, this is fully reliant on libp 2 p and 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 it's there's interoperability. There's uh, Rust nodes, uh, Ethereum consensus nodes, and there's um, also JS one. So they're all reliant on this. Um, another interesting and exciting release is so in the previous episode we had Alex, aka Aching Brain, joined to talk about Helia. Um, Helia is the new implementation of IPFS in JavaScript, TypeScript. I mean, it's TypeScript first, so it's really nice. You get all the typings. Um, and today uh, it reached uh, 1.0. So that means that the API is stable. I'm gonna give it a heart. The API is stable and um, pinning API has been added. You can use this in the browser. You can use this um, in Node.js. Um, a lot of exciting things, especially with regards to transports that it supports. Um, but the whole API just is is a much cleaner um, API if you've used JS IPFS before. 
And speaking of releases, IPFS Cluster just had a new release two weeks ago. So IPFS Cluster is how you scale multiple Kubo nodes and manage them. Um, and uh, the main thing is that it's using a new data store. So uh, I think it, it, you had the option of running Badger and Level DB. These are essentially like key value stores that are used by uh, uh, each one of the um, nodes in the IP, in IPFS cluster. And I believe that this new one is using this one that is called Pebble, uh, which was uh, developed by the Cockroach DB team. Um, so yeah, check that out. Uh, it seems that uh, upon testing that this delivers much, uh, uh, a lot of performance improvements. Um, so yeah, check it out. And I think that uh, that is pretty much it. I mentioned Iro. You can check out their GitHub. I uh, don't know if they've actually done the release yet. Uh, let's see. No, they still haven't uh, released it. But uh, let's see. Hopefully, it should be relief, uh, released soon. Um, let's see if there's anything else here. Blue Sky Social, yes, I mentioned Blue Sky. Um, Blue Sky is a, a new protocol and it's building on top of, well, the protocol is called At Protocol and uh, they're using, it's a new decentralized protocol, um, decentralized sorry, social media protocol. And um, I have two invitations if you're interested, hit me up on Twitter and I'd be happy to share two invitations to Blue Sky. Um, but under the hood, it is using IPLD, which is the data sort of model that IPFS uses. So if you're interested, I highly recommend checking it out. Very interesting protocol. They're using uh, IPLD, they're using DIDs, um, doing some interesting stuff, uh, human uh, friendly naming and sort of being able to link your handle to your own domain. So it's all about, you know, self-certifying protocols and, and, and user sovereignty. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out. And with that, I think we're about uh, done here. If you've stayed with us this long, thank you for staying. And uh, we hope to see you here soon. I will likely be taking a break from the next episode as I'm expecting um, twins. Um, so uh, stay tuned. We might have a different host. Um, and if not, we will uh, keep you updated.